uh, also known as Forum BX257, here being another 1980s GI Joe tour review. And today I'll be taking a look at the Cobra Hydrofoil, the 1985 Moray, and its pilot, the Lampreys. Now, the Moray makes its first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of GI Joe in issue number 36, but the Lampreys pilots don't make their first appearance until issue 40. Both the Moray and the Lamprey pilots make their first animated appearance in the 1985 Season 1 five-part opener, The Pyramids of Darkness, in Part 4. Now, you're probably thinking that I've already reviewed the Moray, but that was over five years ago. Man, a lot's changed since then. The Moray Hydrofoil is a large gunboat measuring about 20 inches long and about 7 inches high. It's just encrusted with weapons, but it still maintains a very sleek appearance, meaning that it looks like it still goes quite fast, even though it's loaded for bear. It has two of these large forward cannons, one on each side of the, uh, front, of the front middle of the hull here. Unfortunately, they don't move around. But they do have nice little vented shrouds at the front there, giving it a very aggressive look. But speaking of moving, it has this forward cannon which sort of peeks through into the uh, driver cabin here. It has a little handle there, so I suppose the passenger side can actually grip that on the other side, but it's actually kind of um, right where this beam is. So, it's actually kind of hard to get an action figure to actually hold on to that part portion of the gun. That's rather unfortunate. On the top here, we have a turret cannon. The turret itself can swivel 360 degrees. And the cannon itself can move up and even down with a little bit of a ratchet. It has handholds here, so a figure can actually hold on to that. The very skinny handholds, so I don't anticipate breaking any thumbs putting the figure hands on there. And I certainly don't anticipate breaking the handles off because it is actually um, a fairly sturdy, very, fairly flexible plastic that they've used for this portion of the cannon. On the side here, we have these missiles which are pegged in onto the side here, and there are two of these on each side. Underneath that, we have these large torpedoes. This torpedo is rather plain. I really love the decal on this thing. On the back, we have these small swiveling defense machine guns for them able to swivel on their pegs, but they are just pegged in. They aren't permanently uh, pegged in there. They're very well, very minimally detailed. Last but not least, we have a little drawer full of depth charges. And these are actually rather interestingly detailed. Of course, the, the point of these depth charges is to release them this way and they fall out into the water towards a pursuing craft or perhaps over on top of a submarine underneath the moray. And one of the coolest features of the moray is the missile box which pops up. It also has a little deflector screen here. And you're supposed to push down on this actuator and it reveals the missile box with four of these missiles. They're a little bit hollow on one side, which is kind of unusual. Normally, uh, Hasbro does take a bit of pride in making these um, uh, full, but <laughs> these ones, for some strange reason, are not. Right in front of the driver and the passenger, there are these hatches, which open gullwing style, and they're large enough to fit a figure in there. As a matter of fact, there is, as you can sort of see in there, a foot peg. 
so you can put a figure in there. Now the figure, of course, uh, has to sort of crouch in order to get all the way in there. They can't stand because this is a standing figure, and they're, they're well halfway out of the uh, halfway out of the thing. But you can get a figure to sort of uh, get in there if you sort of bypass the little portion which has the uh, foot peg, and the thing can just go right down on there. On the passenger side of the craft on the front here is a searchlight which just kind of swivels around and again has a nice little handle now this only the uh, small peg portion is something that I would recommend putting the uh, figure's hand on and not the thicker portion the searchlight is of course one of the more infamous parts of the moray because there should be a searchlight here a search lens I should say but I have opted not to put it in. The original owner didn't put it in, and I'm not going to either, because he or she left it still on the uh, sprue tree here. So this is what the lens would have looked like. And it would have just gone in there and friction fit onto here. It wouldn't have really locked in there. Of course, it pops out and it gets lost forever. So I'm just going to leave this thing off. It looks just fine the way it is. It may be a little bit hard to see, but the inside cabin does have two seats, one for a passenger and one for the main driver. The uh, seats don't swivel. There is, however, some really nice control panel detail. And of course, this is the driver side because if you take out the uh, lamp right here, you can see that it does have a steering wheel, which it actually does swivel if you want to. One thing I think I ought to mention about the turret, well, if, well there are two figures in the cabin, is that you do have to sort of be careful when putting a figure in here. I'll just put this figure in here and you can see that I've completely uh, bent the legs here just to put them in here. And there is actually a foot peg there and it does help line up the feet especially if you're swiveling the uh, the turret if the figure's feet are sort of even a little bit splayed out they're gonna knock the head of your driver or your passenger or it gets stuck on the back here if you're swiveling it all the way around there's very little clearance for the figure's uh, legs here on the back portion we have a removable engine cover with a nice little actual see-through vent and a lot of nice engine detail here. Right beside that you can see that there, there are these, um, these covers with foot pegs on them. Three foot pegs and there are of course three stations. One interesting thing about these covers is that if you do take them off which is a little bit difficult with my uh, my fat fingers but if you do take them off there is space underneath them now as you can see they do have these little uh, friction tabs to keep it locked in place so they do fit on there and they do stay on there really really well but they can be removed and there is enough space underneath there so you can actually put some gear as long as it's kind of small or kind of skinny of course, if you're populating your 1985 Moray with 1985 eels, one thing you may want to put on here are the flippers and the harpoon gun. They actually do fit in there quite well. You can just put the cover right back on there. I do have to tell you, though, if you are buying... A Cobra Moray on the aftermarket and you see these things kind of uh, shut like this you might want to pop them open to see if a previous owner has left any uh, weapons or anything interesting in those little cavities. If you do wind up using those uh, floor coverings as storage I would suggest actually having a uh, screwdriver with a bit of putty on the end uh, handy so you could just take this thing off 
and getting your stuff out that way instead of using uh, your hands. And of course it wouldn't be a hydrofoil if it didn't deploy hydrofoils of course. And so by pushing this tab in it deploys the hydrofoil planes on the bottom. A very nice, very simple mechanism. And the boat actually can rest on them. Despite the fact that I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, just because they are kind of thin plastic and they might get a little bit warped. Of course you can just pull the tab back out. Of course, as far as direct ship-to-ship -ship battles are concerned, the only real rival on the Joe side to the Moray is, of course, the 1984 hovercraft Killer Whale. Itself a very large vehicle, weapon encrusted just like the Moray, and just like how the Moray has pop-out hydrofoils for extra speed, the Killer Whale is, of course, a hovercraft and can go on land as well as be in the sea. Speaking of supplementary naval vehicles for the Cobra side, in 1985 we also got the Night Landing Raft, which I've always been kind of surprised that there wasn't some way of just attaching this thing on here. However, a very clever uh, fellow collector actually tuned me onto this. If you take the uh, engine and just kind of flip this whole thing around and then place the engine in the cavity right behind the engine block. And of course, if you still have the cannon on there, you can twist that up just a little bit to the side. This thing actually goes down across the entire back end and is actually rather, rather uh, locked in place there. Here's an interesting Easter egg on the stickers. This one in the middle has R-O-N, which stands for Ron Rudat the lead designer at Hasbro, and designer of many of the early G.I. Joe action figures. And now for the portion of the video that I don't really like doing sometimes, but I kind of have to because I have to be an objective reviewer and point out flaws that you might have to look out for on the aftermarket if you're trying to buy one in mint condition or in working condition. One of the biggest flaws of the Moray is, of course, the whole missile box thing. Now, my example is absolutely mint. It was basically just built by one uh, previous guy and just kind of left, well, without stickers and all that. So this hasn't been played with at all. And yet you can see that I'm having a bit of trouble actually locking down the missile, uh, missile box mechanism. You push it down and I kind of wish you turned it or if it kind of locked or clicked into place. And sometimes it just the weight of the missiles in the box is kind of flop the whole thing back down. I wish that were a little bit well, more well thought out, or I kind of just wish this were a simple hinge mechanism and you didn't have this huge button in the way. Then there's the missiles which don't fit into the boxes. I'm not sure if it's the box which isn't designed right or the missiles weren't designed right. Of course, in order for it to be uh, really secure in there you have to push them down and it can be a little bit difficult to, to get them out because well they are kind of down in there that might just be the result of me having big fat hands and not child hands but still I find this really difficult to take the actual missiles out of the boxes and of course if you leave it loose well then they fall into this cavity and of course the moray is designed to float like an actual boat so this whole Hold the gray, whole gray hull portion is of course hollow in order to aid that. So a missile falls into there, it's kind of gone. You really have to shake this thing up and turn it upside down in order for one of these things to fall out of one of the holes. One interesting fault in the construction, which is again something that you really do have to look out for on the aftermarket, is whether you have a version 1 or version 2 body for the hull. Now, the body, the uh, maroon portion is attached to the hull by these little clips that you can see on the very front here and that's all you have on the version 1 this is the version 1 a version 2 will have extra clips here and I would suggest looking out for the version 2 body because 
with the clips just holding the whole thing on here, as you can see, this is kind of ripping those pegs out. And there's a lot of stress there, and I'm kind of afraid that the curved hull with the very flat body on top just doesn't mate very well. You really do need those extra clips here. I kind of wish they had thought of that to begin with, but oh well. At least you can look out for something a bit better on the aftermarket. Back here we have another unfortunate problem, and that is these, uh, these little machine guns are very easy just to crack off. What's even worse is that their little pintles actually crack off in the holes. So even if you get a replacement uh, machine gun, or you try to just repair it, you have to somehow get the uh, cracked uh, pintle which is stuck into the pegs on the side of the uh, back of the whole hull here. Design-wise, while I still do love the Moray, one of its biggest problems is that all the action is kind of concentrated right here. I mean, you're supposed to have enough spaces for 11 figures. And while it looks good with just, you know, like a guy in the passenger seat, a guy in the driver's seat, a guy in the turret, and let's just say one guy manning the guns here and another guy manning the depth charges, it looks fine like that. And yet you're supposed to have even more guys in here, two guys sort of hidden, squashed into these uh, little hatches here. And no less than six guys in the back here. It's just too cramped looking. I just kind of wish there were some way of spacing this thing out. Or maybe not having the two guns here. Or maybe just having like one. Because honestly, with this big engine in the way, it's already very hard to get the figures to stand sort of the way you want them to. Because... Well, the guns are so low on this thing, you have to have these figures bent. And it just doesn't look right. And it's very hard to maneuver the figures with the big engine in the way. This engine should have been flush with the floor of the rear of the cabin. Not like up and raised like this. Unlike a lot of drivers, the Lamprey actually does come with an accessory. A weapon at that. And while it's not officially called anything... It clearly has the look of a British Sten submachine gun with its uh, sideways ammunition and its very big triangular portion right in front of the trigger. It's actually a very well made little uh, accessory as well because the plastic that, they, uh, that they've used here is actually a little bit flexible, meaning that the normally fragile shoulder strap isn't very easily, very isn't easily broken on this thing. As a matter of fact, when the Lamprey doesn't have his hands free to hold the weapon, I generally tend to just hook it around this, um, I guess this is supposed to be an antenna or something. It's actually rather small and stubby. As a matter of fact, I'm actually a bit more confident in the plastic that the gun is made out of than the plastic that the uh, body portion is made of because I think this little portion, this peg or antenna, tends to actually break more often than I've seen a, a broken strap onto the gun. I have to agree with the Cobra Commander, the Lamprey's uniform is très chic. Despite being stylized and futuristic looking, you can still tell that he is a pilot of some sort at least. Sure, you might think that the silver is an odd choice for his main bodysuit, but it gives me the impression of a thermal suit. Something to act against the cold waters of the Pacific or Atlantic or wherever he's operating. Of course, he has these little zippers just by his feet and by his wrists, just so they can keep out the uh, water out of his boots and his gloves. Of course, there's also one on his life vest, which is one of the oddest things about the figure is that they they chose to use two different shades of light blue. One for his, his, uh, well, for his helmet. I'm not quite sure whether this was supposed to be a visor or what. His gloves and all sorts of other details. And then a ver very light blue for his vest. Now, I understand that vests are supposed to be uh, brightly colored so you can uh, 
rescue people stuck in the dark oceans. So this thing would be highly visible. But it's just kind of strange that they used the two different shades of, of blue. Rather than just going with the light blue for everything. One other very interesting thing is the patch. It's a very interesting patch. It, it's not a cobra patch and it's not a, a patch which matches anything that was on the Mori itself. It appears to be a skull wearing a beret with a knife through it within a shield. I'm hoping I'm visually interpreting that correctly. Another very interesting things are the little pops of gold on him, like the belt buckle and on his knife. But one thing that's interesting is that he has a holster, but with clearly no gun in it. He seems to be missing a pistol, but has added a submachine gun to his uh, arsenal instead. The interesting thing about the color scheme for the lamprey is that the blue and silver actually work for a naval environment. And yet, as a driver for the Moray, it kind of it kind of contrasts rather badly. Of course, the Moray is mostly a gray hull, but it also has that very prominent maroon body on top. And that's where the things get really interesting because it's not so much that the um, the Lamprey is a bad fit for uh, the Moray; it's just that the Moray has a very odd color scheme for being a naval vessel. Uh, the previous large vessel for Cobra was of course the uh, 1984 water moccasin which was a kind of a greenish bluish kind of color and worked very well. This however does not, it really sticks out. And during my original review of this toy I noted that I didn't get it at first. Like I, I, just, I just didn't get why they went with this color instead of continuing on with um, the water moccasins color scheme or maybe making a blue or black or some other very cobra color. That was until I realized that at the same year we get the 1985 eels which have a primarily gray uh, body with a very dark red chest in the middle. So while you're supposed to get one of these guys with your moray, you're supposed to get multiples of the eels at the same time to command your moray. A couple of things to point out about the Lamprey's file card is that they actually have to start out as eels, which is a nice bit of world building continuity here. Of course, the eels is sort of a stepping stone to other uh, branches of the Cobra military, like snow serpents and ice vipers and such. Another very interesting thing is, they actually put in a pay grade for him, which is kind of like the rank. And it's very unusual on Cobra file cards, but here he's an O3, which I believe means a captain. So basically, the Lamprey is an officer, whereas the eels generally have a pay grade of E4, or enlisted four or corporal, meaning that he can totally be a commander of a little squad of eels. One unfortunate thing is, is that the uh, the equipment for the eels does not fit on a lamprey. As a matter of fact, the flippers in particular from a eel are just too narrow for the feet of lampreys. So what I actually have here are the flippers from a 1988 vehicle pack, G.I. Joe Scuba Pack, which, as you can see here, has a very interesting color scheme because it's silver plastic with little bits of blue and black. So if you have a scuba pack, perhaps without the stickers, this thing looks like a great little escape craft for a lamprey, especially if his moray has been uh, destroyed by G.I. Joe fire. The little mouthpiece, which normally just hangs in front of a figure's face, actually kind of fits very snugly right up against the cutout that's on the bottom of the lamprey's helmet.
today I'm going to be taking a look at the um, well I'm not really sure what it's called an actuator the plastic of the, 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 the well that's all the time I have right now Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.